Greetings and welcome to another episode of Tales and Treasures. My name is Rob Saltz and I live here on the Donnelly Homestead up here in Bedolph Township. We're going to take a look at some of the events which led up to the massacre of this particular Canadian family early Wednesday morning, February the 4th in 1880. This particular homestead originally was part of the uh, Huron Tract. The Canada Company opened it up in the early 1830s. We'll take a look at some of the uh, events which led up to that uh, rather fateful uh, early morning when the family was uh, mostly uh, wiped out. Let's go back to 1842. That was the year that James and Johanna Donnelly came over from Tipperary. She was 21 and he was 26. She was almost as strong as he was and just as tall. When they first arrived here, uh, James got a, uh, a job as a freight handler down in London. He had been a uh, coach driver for one of the Protestant landowners back in Ireland and James wanted to get a chunk of property for himself, but he, he did not want to deal with the Canada Company uh, directly. To, to get a chunk of land, you had to come up with some money, and uh, he didn't have it. He felt perhaps it would be better to uh, come up here and uh, squat on the land and work out some kind of an arrangement with one of the leasees. In 1845, he came up here, and right where I'm standing, uh, he built a small Irish shanty. It had uh, no floor, just mud. It had no windows. It had an opening for a door, but only had a rug over it. He did not live uh, here in 1845. Uh, he went back down to uh, London, where Johanna gave birth to their second son, uh, William. William's uh, right leg was a little shorter, and the foot was rather shriveled, and we required to have a, uh, a shoe that was built up. Um, in about 1847, thereabouts, uh, James uh, and, and uh, Johanna, whom he called Judy, and the, the two boys came up again, and this time uh, Johanna was expecting their third child, and they lived across the road for a short time, and then moved into this little Irish shanty, where he uh, managed to fix it up and, and live for a number of years. Uh, he obviously had some kind of an arrangement with the man who was leasing the land from the Canada Company, a man by the name of John Grace. Now John Grace had no intention, I understand, of living here. He already lived down in London Township. But in order to do the required improvements on the land, um, you had to do this in order to hold on to your land. Obviously James Donnelly was doing the, the improvements, cutting down so much timber every year. Whether he paid uh, rent, uh, we're not sure. However, there came a point in time in the mid-1850s when John Grace informed James Donnelly that his lease had been uh, paid up and he would like to sell the land and he asked James Donnelly to move on. James Donnelly did not want to move. He felt that he had made the improvements and would like to have the option uh, to purchase and he resisted moving. Uh, John Grace took him to court to have him evicted and James Donnelly fought back with his own court case. And the upshot was that James Donnelly was allowed to keep the north half of Lot 18. Well, Lot 18 in those days as it is today, does today, goes all the way from the road back to the bush and from that large tree over there where I keep my bees to the south of the house and the whole bean field. Well, the bean field as it is today was taken away from him and James Donnelly was allowed to purchase reasonably, a reasonable price, the north half where we're standing here today. He was rather down in his cups, you might say. He was rather depressed about the whole thing. And a distant relative of his, a man who lived up the road, one Patrick Farrell, uh, was telling his friends that uh, he was going to get James Donnelly's other 50 acres. That is, the 50 acres we're standing here today. And uh, James Donnelly got, got drunk, took a rifle, and took a shot at Pat Farrell. Pat Farrell said, you're not going to do that to me. He took him to court, and the upshot of that particular court case was that both men were put on peace bonds, meaning that for a whole year they had to stay away from each other. Well, that year was up. It was June the 25th, 1857, and it was across the road. If we just went across the road and just north of us here, um, there was a 25-acre plot of land. And there was a, a man by the name of Maloney. He was having a logging bee. And James Donnelly was over there on that fateful day, 
Uh, there was a grog boss handing out Irish whiskey because you couldn't get much work out of the men unless you kept them uh, more or less lubricated. And by the early part of the afternoon, James Donnelly and Pat Farrell, naked to the waist, were fist fighting in Maloney's potato patch. The men were using hand spikes, which are long pieces of hardwood originally used on board naval vessels to lift the back end of cannon to uh, allow the, uh, uh, the gun aimer to put an elevation wedge in. But the early part of the afternoon, the fight resumed and it was over the, the one thing was uh, Pat Farrell was saying you took a shot at me and James Donnelly was saying you tried to get my land. Both men were, were quite drunk except Pat Farrell was really, really inebriated. James Donnelly was letting on he was a lot drunker than he really was. The point came when Pat Farrell was coming up from the ground, James Donnelly took his hand spike, swung it like a baseball bat, and connected with Pat Farrell's left temple. He ruptured an artery, and the man died right there. Several authors will, will write, and you might read sometime, that he languished for three days before he expired. No, he died right there. James Donnelly suddenly became very sober. He rushed back here, told Judy, Johanna, what had happened, and uh, when they came to arrest him a few days later, they couldn't find him. Poor Pat Farrell was taken up to his farm, and a few days later, it was into July, there was no refrigeration, and by the time the coroner arrived to examine the body, the, uh, uh, when he did look at the body, the cranial bones in the head came apart in his hand. Uh, the magistrate issued a, a warrant for the arrest of James Donnelly, but as I said, he could not be found. He hid out from July 1857 until May of 1858. The, uh, in the barns, in beds, under beds, in straw stacks, anywhere he could find refuge. There were stories of him uh, approaching the house late at night here, where there were several candles in the window. In fact, Earl Haywood had a song, uh, I believe it was called uh, Two Candles or Three Candles in the Window, indicating it was safe to approach the house. Well, the winter time of, uh, winter time of 1857, early 1858, was uh, nearly killed James Donnelly. And in May of 1858, even though there was a price on his head, he was uh, persuaded to give himself up. They figured that perhaps he'll get a reprimand, perhaps he'll get a short jail sentence, maybe a fine. When he was uh, apprehended, more or less he gave himself up, he was taken up to Godrich, 50 miles away which at that time was the seat of government. This was not part of uh, Middlesex County as it is today. And the, uh, he went before a judge, a man by the name of uh, Justice uh, John Beverly Robinson, who was a man who was instrumental back in the rebellion of 1837 as a hanging judge. And James Donnelly was found guilty of murder and sentenced to be executed in September of that year, 1858. Johanna was expecting at the time, she had given birth by this point to uh, seven sons, and now she was going to give, uh, getting ready to give birth to her last child, which turned out to be a girl. She was actually just kind of blown right out of the water. She came home here, and in the meantime, she managed to get petitions signed asking for leniency for her husband. And when the time was right, she walked all the way up to Godrich, pregnant as she was, to present the papers to the powers that be. They heard her prayers of supplication, and they thought, well, here's a woman who is in the family way, and she already has seven sons. Um, they decided to commute his sentence from being executed to life imprisonment. Life imprisonment in those days was seven years in the Kingston Penitentiary. The man who signed the commutation later became Sir John A. MacDonald. Um, James Donnelly went away to Kingston and didn't come back till 1865. 